Welcome to AstroCast.TV, your source for news and information about astronomy and our solar system. Now, here are your hosts, NASA JPL Solar System Ambassadors, Greg Redford and Dr. Lori Figge. It's episode 11, and I'll be talking about a pair of rovers that were supposed to last 90 days on Mars and are now entering their fifth year of operations on the Red Planet. I'll also discuss India's Chandrayaan-1, which has been having some overheating problems, but has been returning data using just one of the 11 instruments at a time to avoid additional problems. NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope reveals six dead white dwarf stars with shredded material orbiting around them. Also looking for other solar systems and Earth analogs is NASA's Kepler mission, set to launch from Cape Canaveral, Florida on March 6, 2009. But first, some headlines. Students from the College of Engineering at Virginia Tech have developed a new and durable type of brick that may be later used to build dwellings on the moon. Using a volcanic ash, much like lunar material, and mixing it with a powdered aluminum and then heating it cause a reaction to form a solid brick. The team was led by student advisor Catherine Logan, a professor of material science and engineering at the National Institute of Aerospace. On December 31st, New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson announced that Virgin Galactic had signed a 20-year lease agreement with the state of New Mexico. Virgin Galactic's world headquarters will be established in New Mexico and its operations will be located at New Mexico's Spaceport America, the nation's first purpose-built commercial spaceport. Construction is scheduled to begin in the first quarter of 2009 with a terminal and hangar facility scheduled for completion in 2010. In related news, the White Knight 2 christened Eve made its first flight on December 21, 2008. Pilot for the flight was Peter Siebold, Scaled Composites Director of Flight Operations, and the co-pilot was Clint Nichols, also of Scaled. The one-hour flight explored handling qualities at altitudes up to 16,000 feet. White Knight 2, the carrier aircraft that will ferry Spaceship 2, and thousands of private astronauts, science packages and payloads on the first stage of the Virgin Galactic Suborbital Space Experience. Observations made with NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope reveal six dead white dwarf stars with shredded material from asteroids orbiting around them, bringing the total to eight such systems. These results were presented by Michael Jura and colleagues at the American Astronomical Society meeting in January 2009 in Long Beach, California. The environment surrounding the white dwarfs, studied by Spitzer at infrared wavelengths, has rocky dust particles composed of olivine-like silicates. This material, determined by its spectral fingerprint, is similar to minerals found on the Earth and terrestrial planets in our own solar system. A single asteroid is thought to have broken apart within the last million years around each of these white dwarfs to create the dusty debris. The increasing number of known systems with asteroids suggests that systems similar to our own solar system could be common in the universe. Also looking for other solar systems and Earth analogs is NASA's Kepler mission, set to launch from Cape Canaveral, Florida on March 6, 2009. Kepler is NASA's 10th discovery mission and is a spacecraft dedicated to searching for Earth-sized planets around other stars in our galaxy. The Kepler telescope is nearly one meter in diameter and is called a photometer, or light meter, with a large field of view. It will stare continuously at one piece of sky for over three years in order to monitor more than 100,000 stars. It will measure the dimming of starlight created when an Earth-sized planet transits or moves in front of its parent star. For more information on Kepler, see my blog site. You've all seen the TV commercial for a particular brand of batteries with a cool rabbit beating the drum while the announcer says just keeps going and going and going. Well, that aptly sums up a pair of rovers that were supposed to last 90 days on Mars and are now entering their fifth year of operations on the Red Planet. Spirit and Opportunity landed on nearly opposite sides of Mars in January 2004 and set out on an incredible adventure of exploration in which humanity was able to ride along. The intrepid and aging pair has returned over 36 gigabytes of data, about a quarter million images, and oh yes, don't forget the 12 miles they have traveled on the Red Planet. 
All of this while surviving frigid temperatures, sand traps, entering and exiting impact craters, and raging dust storms. The rovers have become human-like to their controllers and those of us who have followed their ventures closely. They have found meteorites on the surface of Mars and made truly remarkable discoveries about what NASA scientists describe as wet and violent environments on ancient Mars. And just like that TV bunny, they will keep going and going and going as long as NASA can keep them rolling along. And Astrocath.tv will be there. The International Year of Astronomy continues engaging people from around the world in astronomical activities. From March 16th through March 28, 2009, people who want to participate in the Globe at Night project will measure the darkness of their local skies by finding stars near the constellation Orion using their very own eyes as instruments. After observing, people can contribute their observations to a worldwide map online. Countries that plan to participate in Globe at Night are shown here. No prior experience or telescope is necessary, and all information needed to participate is on the Globe at Night website, along with downloadable activity guides in six languages. I have a link to the Globe at Night from my blog site. The goal of this project is not just to stargaze, but also to increase public awareness of the impact of artificial lighting on the environment. The number of people now living in urban areas exceeds half the number of people on Earth, and with increased city populations, there is more light pollution. Light pollution has a negative influence on many animals and plants in a variety of ways. See my blog site for some examples. India's Chandrayaan-1 has been having some overheating problems, but has been returning data using just one of the 11 instruments at a time to avoid additional problems. This problem is expected to be overcome soon, which will allow all instruments to function normally and simultaneously. There are two instruments from NASA, the Moon Mineralogy Mapper and the Mini Synthetic Aperture Radar that have returned data recently and have provided valuable lunar insights. China published the first full map of the Moon's surface based on the photographs of that country's first lunar probe, Chang'an 1. It took the world's clearest and fullest Moon surface map to date. Check out the cool HD video released by Japan's space agency from its Kaigua Selene spacecraft. Not to be left out, recent studies of the oldest rock found on the moon during the Apollo 17 mission, the last time men walked on the moon in December 1972, have revealed strong evidence that the moon once had a molten core. We have much to learn about the moon. We know more about Mars than we do our closest neighbor in space. NASA expect to return to the moon in April with the launch of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and the Lunar Crater Observation Sensing Satellite. The constellation Aurigos shines brightly overhead this month. Capella, its brightest star, is a member of the winter hexagon. Argo represents the charioteer in western Skylore, but the constellation mostly looks like hexagon. If you're away from city lights, look for the Milky Way running through the constellation. Binoculars will reveal many more stars on the Milky Way than the naked eye does. Argo also features several star clusters that are easy to see in binoculars or even a small telescope. The best targets are known as M36, M37, and M38. You can expect to see each one as a small fuzzy patch of stars, and with a larger telescope, more stars will be visible. These are similar to the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, star cluster, but more distant. For your convenience, I'm now posting my script and graphics on my blog site, Our Night Sky, so you can print them out and take them with you when you go out to observe. For all of us here at Astrocast.tv, I'm Greg Redfern. And I'm Lori Figgy. Tune in next time as we learn more about the wonders and mysteries of the universe in which we live and explore.